we said to, we said to greet one another, telling your favorite fruit. Some of y'all were like trying to think of, okay, how many fruit can I name, right? Now, hey, we, we kind of do have a food theme here going on this morning, it seems like, because right next to me is my friend Kristen Powell. And uh, Kristen is part of an incredible ministry that we partner with here called New Hope Food Pantry. Kristen, tell us just a little bit about New Hope. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am on the board for New Hope Food Pantry, which I've done for a while, um, which is, you guys are very familiar, um, but a food pantry here in Topeka, located kind of at the heart of downtown, um, where there's a great need. And we help provide food and some other um, additional items like toiletries, um, which we call hygiene packs. Uh, We have some diapers, just other kind of random products uh, besides food, but we help to provide for the people of Topeka that are in need. Yeah, and, and boy, there, there's a lot of need, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> so I know everybody's feeling it. Um, everybody uh, goes to the grocery store and everything's more expensive and it's harder and harder to put food on our table. Um, and that obviously extends to what we do as well. So the need is growing and continues to grow in our community. Um, and it feels like the resources are less and less. Yeah, and, and they partner with harvesters to get a lot of their food. They order by the truckload. But the truth is, and we've, we've got this notice both from harvesters, from them, and other ministries that we partner with, there's not as much food this year. It's just not available. And so there's not as much to give away to the community at large that can be bought at a discount. So us coming alongside becomes kind of important, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So exactly like you said, harvesters, um, it's been harder and harder to get food. So the, the food pantry is more and more dependent on individuals like the people at our church or people in the community that are giving items um, in order for us to provide for the community. Yeah. And, and so, but, but there's some, we're not just about giving food, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> handing it to them is kind of big too. Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the things I love most about the food pantry, the way that it's set up. um, There's a lot of interaction that happens between the people that are serving and the people that are being served. Um, And then additionally, they have started um, having kind of a table outside where one of the gentlemen sits with coffee and donuts and just provides an opportunity um, to what we ultimately want to do is which is share the gospel with these people and let them know about the love of Jesus. So um, there's a lot of opportunity just um, within how the food pantry is set up for your entire family to come and experience serving um, and providing physical as well as spiritual uh, food for people that come. Okay. Yeah. And, and so if somebody here wanted to volunteer, right, because because you could you could volunteer by handing out food. You could volunteer by actually sharing Christ in the lions, right? And and then there's some Bible studies going on and things like that. Tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, absolutely. So um, outside of just the food line that we have, um, there's a men's Bible study that happens. We also provide, as I said, um, some additional items. There's also books, um, different devotionals, Bibles that are available at the food pantry. So any and all of those items are welcome, uh, not only for our church to provide, but also for you to come and serve alongside uh, the other people that work there to help um, provide any of that out to the people that come. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things in this service that we're trying to push people into is to start doing mission as a family. Talk to us about those opportunities, Kristen. Yeah, so this place is really special to me and my family. We've literally been bringing our whole family, including our girls, when they were babies. Um, So it feels a little bit like they've grown up there. So um, I can personally attest it's a fantastic place to bring your entire family. Uh, They can all serve. There's all a part, no matter how little they are, uh, to help. Um, And it's just really sweet to see uh, families serve together and to give our kids some opportunity. Um, so there's some things that they can't do uh, in other areas, but this is absolutely something that they can, no matter how young they are, um, and to be able to see that. So definitely bring your family. Uh, it's a really fun time. Yeah, and this is such a worthwhile ministry. Matter of fact, we have a lot of people here that volunteer also at New Hope. If you've ever volunteered down there, would you stand? Is there anybody in this in this congregation? Go ahead. Yeah, we have quite a few. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so so here's what we want to do. Stay standing. Stay standing. Because, Kristen, how can we pray? How can we pray for new hope? How can we pray for the people you serve? 
you know, what's, what's the need here? Yeah, so I'll start just, um, we're open four times a month, so second and fourth Monday and first and third Saturday, always from nine to noon. So one of the prayers is just for people to come and help serve, uh, so definitely can be praying for that, um, as well as items. As I mentioned before, um, there's a lot of different items that um, the food pantry gives out to try to meet people's physical needs, uh, and so just donating those items, uh, making sure that there's provision within the food pantry, and then of course, um, our, our most important um, aspect is just providing an opportunity for people to respond to Jesus, and so just having um, that opportunity for people to come and have soft hearts to the Lord, um, as well as the people that are working to be bold and sharing uh, why they're there and why... Um, you know, providing this matters to them uh, to be able to show Christ. Yeah. So, so let's pray together, shall we? All right. Father, thank you so much for ministries that we can partner with like New Hope. And I ask you, Father, would you uh, help us not to miss one opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ and the message of Jesus Christ with those who are so desperate to hear it? They might not even know they're desperate to hear it, Father. But, uh, man... It would be horrible for us to feed their belly and not their soul. So, Father, I pray, I pray, God, that you would help us to be a relief. I pray that you would help us to take advantage of every opportunity you give us to be on mission representing Jesus. I pray for Kristen and all of these volunteers that are standing and those that aren't here, Father, that maybe were here in the first service or others that are in other churches today, Father, that you would just empower them by your Holy Spirit to be and do exactly what is needed in those moments to meet those needs for this purpose. So, Father, thank you that you allow us to be a part of a church that isn't inward focused, but instead, Father, we want what's on the inside of us to get out. Help us, Father, to be generous. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, indeed. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Claire, for the way you lead us every week to not to focus on, you, you understand that whenever we clap, right? We're going to talk about this in a minute, but whenever we clap, whenever we applaud, we're not applauding because they did a good job. We don't applaud because, hey, that was great. Our applause has an audience of one. And the truth that we just sang reveals the reality that he is worthy of our praise, that he's worthy of our applause, he's worthy of our attention, he's worthy of our heart. So whenever we applaud, whenever we do things, here's what we're recognizing. We're recognizing that God is worthy. Now, before we step into this sermon on authentic worship this weekend, I think I should do something here, and some of you may like it, some of you may not, and I personally don't care. Um, but if you served in our nation's military, would you stand? If you ever served, would you stand? Yeah. And, and, and do me a favor. Re remain standing for just a minute. If I didn't take a moment this weekend to say thank you to those of you who served, all the crazy arguments that we're hearing, and the fact that we even get to have these arguments is based upon a freedom that you help purchase. The open worship of our King that we're got, we have enjoyed today and will continue to enjoy is because you and men like you have fought to secure that right. The safety and future for our children and grandchildren is strong because of your sacrifice. And I think that it's fitting this Veterans Day weekend that we say thank you. We say thank you. We don't worship you, but we're grateful to you. We don't, you know, we don't want to elevate you past where you are, but, but we want you to know that we're grateful because many of us here get to serve in a different way because you serve that way. And I just want you to know that this pastor is very grateful to you. And uh, I appreciate you. And I thank you for what you've done. And because of what you've done, we get to do this. So thank you. A 
A.W. Tozier once said, the missing jewel of the modern church is the jewel of worship. I don't know a more fitting subject during this hour than worship. Last Sunday, we began this series of messages called Authentic Worship. So I want you to take your Bible and join me again. Go to the Gospel of John. And once you're there, find the fourth chapter. We saw these verses last Sunday as we learned some things about the experience of worship. We learned about the definition of worship. The word that was used by Jesus was a compound word. It means to kiss toward. To kiss toward. It also means to, it literally it means to bow down. It's a, it speaks of giving honor, like you would kiss somebody's hand. It means giving respect. It means to give praise. Psalm 103 verse 1 says, says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. I'm going to ask you a question that I asked the first service, and some of them got mad at me because they didn't like my answer, but don't take it up with me. Take it up with Scripture. Are there different degrees of sin? I don't think not. You're wrong, but that's okay. Here's, here's Here's what Jesus said. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest command? If there's a greatest command, then there has to be a greatest sin, right? So what's the greatest command? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The biggest sin isn't whatever the social uh, taboo is of the day. The biggest sin and the one sin that we commit that unhinges every other sin is to fail to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. That's the biggest one. You see, worship starts on the inside and works its way out. It doesn't start on the outside and work its way in. An Orthodox Jew will take those two verses and they'll quote them twice a day. Matter of fact, if if, if we could go together, and I know right now that's not possible. I had a big trip of about 39 of you next year that was supposed to go in May, and I pray that things turn around, but it doesn't look good right now. Um, but, But if I could take you to the Wailing Wall, you would notice there's there's a line of Jews. On the, if you're facing the wall on the left side, it would be all men. On the right side, it would be all women. And, and as, you, as, you, as you have that, you, you'll notice there's some Jews there, and they'll take these prayer shawls, and they'll throw them over their head. And they'll write on little pieces of paper what they're praying. And they'll roll them up, and they'll stick them in the wall. And then they'll begin praying. And you'll see them pray like this. And they'll hold the end of those tassels in their hands as they're praying. And they'll cry out aloud what they're praying. You ever wonder why people rock like that who are Jews when they're praying? They want there to be an outer demonstration that whenever they're worshiping or praying, they're doing it with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, and with all their strength. And they're doing it from a premise of still expecting a Messiah to come. We, the Messiah we know has already come. I, I ask you a question. How much more then should our worship be with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength? That's what worship's about. It's expressing to God how we feel about him. It's not worship. I'm going to sing right now because I like the song. No. It's because I like the subject of the song. I like the one I'm singing to. It's bowing before him with praise and honor on our lips. And, and, and genuine worship is alive 
and vibrant. It's not dead and dreary. I've heard people say, I, I don't like to go to church. It's boring. Friend, if worship was boring, I wouldn't go either. Worship that's found in the Bible is exciting. The worship found in the Bible is joyful. It's fun. In fact, if I had to go to church where some people go to church, I wouldn't go either. That's not who we are. I can hear some dear brother or sister thinking, Doyle, I don't think we ought to get carried away. For a lot of Baptists, the only time you're ever going to get carried away in church is whenever there's six men on both sides of your casket carrying you out. You know what one of the great enemies of worship is today? It's fear. It's fear of what other people will think about you if you allow yourself to worship the way you feel in your heart. We're afraid of what people might think of us if we sing with all we have and express our heart to the Father. Now, now listen, I am not a singer. I, I am not. I, I sing, but I'm not a singer, Right? Matter of fact, if you stand next, I, I sing loud because I'm not singing to you. I'm not singing. Matter of fact, if, if see somebody besides my wife beside me, and it's in the middle of worship service, they'll usually do this. I call it the two-step shuffle. I don't sound good. I know that. But may I just say to you, I'm not singing to you. And here's how powerful God is. Here's how powerful God is. God is so powerful that he can take my off key. And whenever it goes from my lips to his heart, the Bible says he enjoys praises of his people. That's big, isn't it? It's not about what I sound like. Now, now let me just say, are there people I would much rather hear sing? Yes. There are some people that I've heard get up in church and want to sing a special. They shouldn't have. <laughs> their mama one time told them they could sing and they believed it. Bless their little hearts. But whenever I'm worshiping Jesus from the pew, on my heart, on my mind, on my soul, on my strength, I want to love him expressively. Listen, I'm not afraid of what will happen if we do worship God unhinged. I'm afraid of what will happen if we don't. Listen, you don't have to fear anything that the Bible teaches about worship. I like the way Erwin Lutzer says it. He says, God is looking for worshipers. And if the religious elite are too proud or too busy to learn to worship him, he seeks the worship of those whose lives are trapped in moral ruin. Can I say to you, that was me. All of us come to Jesus Christ broken, not whole. All of us only come to him whenever our lives are in a place or status of moral ruin. We get to worship the king, not because we deserve to be there, but because he has paid our debt. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, don't think anybody can just walk in here and experience genuine worship. If you remember last week, if you look at John chapter 4, verse 23, it says, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. You see, as we talked about last week, to worship, you've got to be first in the family. You can't worship God as God and not understand and have a relationship with him as Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. So for us to even be able to worship God, we have to have a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. Now, once that's settled, the Spirit of God moves into your life. 
He's the one that prompts you to worship. He prods you to worship. He prepares you to worship. And yes, he even purges you so you can worship. It was the psalmist that said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We need God, don't we, to cleanse our hearts so we can stand in the presence of, of the holy God? Oh, I like what David Martin Lloyd-Jones says. The church should be the most exciting and thrilling place in the world. And if she is not, we are somehow or other quenching the spirit. So whenever we sit on our hands, instead of participating, have you ever been in worship before? And I have. I'm confessing. I'm guilty, okay? So I'm not saying something to you that I don't face myself. And God's moving you to do something. And I start to do it. And then I look around and nobody else is doing it. So maybe I put my hand back in my pocket. Anybody else here ever done that? If you have, say, I have. Yeah. You know what the problem is with that? You know what your problem and my problem is? We get to worshiping for the wrong audience. We forget that it's not about the people around us. It's about the one who remade us. The one who created us. Oh, now now, how do we do How do we know what to do in worship? How how do you know that? Well, here's a clue. The Bible. The Bible outlines for us what worship should be like. And and we've talked about the experience of worship, but for the rest of our time together, I want us to look at some of the expressions of worship. I found six. I'm only going to give you three, and the reason I'm only giving you three is because usually the mind can't comprehend what the seat can't endure. So, so let, me, let me give you three of them this morning. Not in their order of importance, they're all important. But the first expression of worship found in our guidebook for worship, the Bible, is singing to the Lord. Singing. Now, during the dark days of American history and segregation, right after the Civil War, our African-American brothers and sisters began to sing. They sang through it, and they developed a new genre of music, and that genre of music was called the blues. And they would sing of their hurt. They would sing of their pain. They they would sing of all of the ways that society has wronged them, about how oppressors have oppressed them, uh, of the opportunities they didn't have. And in the middle of those, in the 1920s, right whenever uh, the, the, the powder keg was at the highest maybe ever, there was a godly Christian woman. And, and I love her story. She's on my playlist for Spotify. Her name is Mahalia Jackson. And Mahalia Jackson, in the middle of everybody else singing the blues, she began to sing gospel. And they ask her, why? And she says, the blues are songs of despair, but gospel songs are the songs of hope. Listen to me. Some of you right now might be in a situation of despair. You might have had something very bad happen this week or last week. You might be going through a time right now that you don't feel. You know why we sing? Not because everything is perfect. We sing because someday it will be. That Jesus will set everything absolutely right. Paul said after, matter of fact, he had just been beaten, thrown in prison, left for dead, shipwrecked. Isolated at sea for three nights and three days, floating on a piece of wood. You know what Paul said? He said, for I reckon these light and momentary afflictions are not worthy being compared to the glory that's awaiting us in Christ Jesus. We don't sing because our lives are perfect. We sing because he's making us so. 
and that he is so big, so mighty, so powerful that, that he can make all things work together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That's something to sing about, isn't it? That the best is yet to come. This idea of singing, you know when it first showed up in the Bible? Exodus 15. You remember the story of the children of Israel leaving Egypt, Pharaoh and his whole army are on their tail. They're going to kill and force them back to Egypt to slavery because their free labor force just left. And they were following them and and, and, and Mo, God told Moses to raise your staff and the Red Sea parted and the children of Israel crossed on dry ground. And then whenever Pharaoh and all of his army got in the middle of that Red Sea, he said, drop your arms. And God wiped out the entire army of Pharaoh. It says, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. And of course, they sang this song after that great victory. But let me ask you a question. Has God opened up any Red Seas for anybody in this room? Do you have a testimony of something that was in your past that almost seemed insurmountable until Jesus got involved? Have you ever had a guilt that weighed on you so heavily, but then you found out that the, the blood of Jesus Christ not just covered it, but eradicated it? Has anybody here ever rejoiced over hearing the verse of Romans 8, chapter 1? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Anybody? That's why they sing. That's why we sing. We sing because of what he has done. We sing because what he is doing. He has not only saved us from a past, the Bible says he is saving us in our present. It's called sanctification. That he is saving us moment by moment from making stupid mistakes if we yield to him. And we sing to him because of what he will do someday called glorification. That every man will be and woman will be presented perfect in Jesus Christ. You know, whenever we sing, I want to submit to you the worst thing about our singing is not when it's off key. The worst thing about our singing is whenever we sing to the wrong audience. Psalm 101 verse 1 says, I will sing of the steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. Hebrews 2.12 saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. I like what Augustine of Hippo said. He said, we are told to sing to the Lord a new song. A new man knows a new song. A song is a thing of joy, and if we think of it, a thing to love. So the man who has learned to love a new life has learned to sing a new song for a new man, a new song, and a new testament all belong to the same kingdom. I think it's sad that we have churches fussing over the kind of music that they sing. Some say, well, give me those great old hymns. I mean, nothing written after like 1900 can be of God, right? Others say, I want those new choruses. Don't you know it got to grieve the heart of God for us to fuss over such stupid stuff? I'm not a hymn man. I'm not a chorus man. I'm a hymn, H-I-M man. And anything that's sung to him, celebrating what he's done, that's a good song right there. See, Whenever we, that's where we get into trouble. When we sing, whatever we sing with a preference, it's kind of to the wrong audience, right? Whether it's a chorus or a hymn, as long as we're singing to the Lord, God is honored. We ought to be happy. By the way, I found a verse that gave evidence for this. It, it says in Psalm 96, 1 and 2, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord 
all of the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. I like what Derek Kidner said. Derek Kidner said, Oh, sing, uh, he, he said the new song is not simply a piece of newly composed, a piece newly composed, though it naturally includes such, but a response that will match the freshness of his mercies, which are new every morning. Can I ask you a question? Are you glad that his mercies toward you are new every morning? That there's going to be mercy whenever you screw it up today? or whenever you mess up tomorrow, that his mercies are going to be new every morning to you. And he's going to extend grace to you, not because you deserve it, because that's his character. That's the reason we worship. That's the reason that we sing. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. See, when Jesus comes in, he makes all things new. John MacArthur reminds us, we are said to receive a new heart, a new spirit, a new song, a new name. We are called a new creation, a new creature, and we have a new self. If that's not a reason to compose a new song, I don't know what is. I know who I was before Jesus, and I'm very glad he saved me from that. Can I remind you that all of us, without the intervention of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, absolutely 100% deserve hell? We do. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Psalm 40, verse 3 says, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Never underestimate the power of a song sung by people who love God, who are singing to the right audience. This verse tells us that people will come to know Jesus through our singing. That's what Jesus was talking about when he instructed us to worship in spirit and in truth, sing true things, sing to the right audience, the audience of the Lord. And people are going to hear it, they're going to see it, and they're going to turn. That's why we give an invitation to people who receive Jesus following a time of worship. It's not uncommon for people to be saved where there's dynamic singing taking place. It's the result of genuine worship. Matter of fact, that's what was happening in the early church. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 47. What was the first Christians doing? They were praising God, okay? Now, now put that as the underlying factor. They were praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So they were singing to the Lord. The second thing they were doing, clapping to the Lord. Now, now I, I know some of y'all thinking, okay, Doyle, come on. I've seen you clap. You have Caucasian rhythm syndrome. <laughs> Granted. I mean, Claire was, I called us a clap a moment ago. I was there. I was right there. And I keep going, and usually the people beside me go, you know, but I'm not clapping just for a beat. Y you understand. Just as those who are don't like choruses or hymns, there are some who don't like clapping in church. You know what I think makes our church pretty strong? Well, one reason is, is because, yeah, we'll sing a hymn, but we'll also sing a chorus. But another reason that First Southern draws our kind of people, because we got the clappers and the non-clappers. I often said that if in this church, whenever we redo it and we put new lights in, if we were to put them on the clapper, I wonder, how, <laughs> I wonder how often they would go on and off. I would bet they stay in position more than not. Just, just wondering. I, I'm sorry. That's just kind of. There's no spiritual value to that wonder right there. 
But I've got news for you non-clappers out there. Psalm 47, 1 and 2. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with songs of joy. For the Lord most high is to be feared a great king over all the earth. Charles Spurgeon maybe said it best whenever he said, no hands need hang down when God draws near in love. The name of Jesus has often made the lame men leap as a heart and made sad men clap their hands for joy. Do you know whenever you get in the presence of Jesus Christ, do you know what's happening? Deliverance has arrived. Hope has arrived. Salvation is here. And you don't have to stay in the situation that you're in one more minute because of it. It's all right to applaud the message just as it's all right to amen a truth. The problem comes when we start clapping at messengers instead of rather than the message. The problem comes when we quit honoring God. If, if we just want to clap and say, oh, that's a good job, honey. Good job. Golf clap, right? That's not glorifying to God. But let me just say this. My hope would be that we never waste time in worship to clap for a person. But instead, that we would never cease to show gratitude to our Father who deserves it so very well. There's a third thing. And I have seven minutes to cover it, so here we go. And this is one that's going to be a problem, shouting to the Lord. I mean, Psalm 47.1 mentions shouting. Clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with loud songs. Maybe that's what I'm doing. Maybe I'm not singing, I'm shouting, right? So if you're shouting, it doesn't matter whether you're on key or off key. That works. I can live with that. Do you know before the charismatic movement drove Baptists into a shell, it wasn't uncommon for Baptist people to shout. And I'm not talking about shouting at one another. I'm talking about shouting to God with a voice of triumph. Sometimes around here I get the feeling that we charge for amens. But friend, whether it's shouting amen to a truth you hear or clapping your hands as an expression of agreement that you hear sung or spoken, here's the challenge. Do it unto the Lord. Not to a person, but do it to the Lord. Do I need to remind you the Lord was not above shouting? We have this idea of Jesus, that Jesus was prim and proper. Whenever Jesus came to the planet, he didn't come to be nice. He didn't come to be nice. John 19, 30 reports that after being offered the drink of sour wine, the Lord Jesus shouted, it is finished. You know what it is finished means in the Greek? It's the word tetelestai. It's an accounting term. It means paid in full. He didn't whisper it, paid in full. He wanted everybody with an earshot to know that their sin was right now at that moment being paid for if they would just receive it. Some things are worth shouting about. J. Vernon McGee reminds us, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. When Jesus comes back, he's not going to whisper, I'm back. No. The four corners of the earth are going to know because the shout is going to be so voluminous. It's going to fill all of creation. And all of those who are his are going to know that the struggle is over. The sin is over. The strife is over. The pain is over. The suffering is over. The tears are over. Why? Because the king has come back. And he's not going to do it with a whisper. He might have came as a gentle lamb the first time. Make no mistake, he's coming back as a roaring lion the second time. Oh, Psalm 32, 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all you that are upright in heart. 
Chuck Swindoll says, I know of no greater need today than the need for joy, unexplainable, contagious, outrageous joy. Whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Do it for the glory of God. You see, the expression of worship will bring glory to God and joy to you. I've heard some people say, well, I, I'm too tired to go to church today. You understand that's when you need to go to church the most. The genuine worship, it'll, it'll refresh you. It'll rejuvenate you. It'll renew you. Genuine medicine is like a, a genuine worship is like a medicine to a sick soul. No wonder Paul from a prison cell at one of his personal darkest moments wrote the words in Philippians 4.4 4 when he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Anybody can rejoice when things are going their way. But when the bottom drops out, when the cancer diagnosis comes in, when hardship strikes, sing to the Lord. And when you sing to the Lord in those moments, the world will take notice. There's an incredible peace and power when you're praising God in the midst of your difficulties. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, God whispers to us in our joys. He speaks to us in our difficulties and shouts to us in our pain. I will never understand how somebody is too sick or weak to attend worship on a Sunday, but they'll spend three hours at a Walmart through the week. I don't get it. Or they'll go, I'll see them at the football stadium. There, there's a lot of people who watch every week from home, and I'm glad you're watching. But if you're healthy enough to get here, we don't do the online ministry as a, as a way for the lazy to worship. Because part of the command is that people will see your worship and they'll receive Jesus. Oh, Psalm 43 says, He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see. You notice he didn't say hear? He didn't say they'll hear our worship. He said, they'll see our worship. They'll see us sing. When those people around you see you sing, are they driven to God? Or do you look like you were weaned on bad dill pickle juice? It's not unusual for people to attend worship here and see people praising God to realize what so many here is lacking in their, what, what so many have here is lacking in their own life. And this morning, you might be that person. You've been watching and listening to all this, and you realize that, that in your own life, there's no joy in your own life. There's no peace. There's no contentment. And, and I want to say to you that before you can have the peace of God, you, you first have to make peace with God. There's a reason you have trouble worshiping. Because Jesus is the only one that can put a song in your heart. Jesus is the only one that can give you a reason to have joy in the midst of difficult times. And that peace that he wants to give you is made available in his son, Jesus Christ. I wonder if you'd bow your head and close your eyes with me for just a moment as our worship team comes up. I wonder if there might be some here today and you say, yeah, everything that you're talking about, I don't have. I'd like it, but I don't have it. I don't have that joy. I don't have that drive. I don't have that desire to worship the Lord Jesus. But I'd love to have what you're talking about. If that's you today, these next few moments are going to be very critical because you don't have to be without joy any longer. You don't have to be without the desire of praise any longer. You can focus and celebrate and know that the best is yet to come if you do one very critical thing. 
you'll receive the offer of Jesus Christ. He loves you with an everlasting love. He wants to come in and save you.